everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Lit RPG Audiobook Podcast. I am Ray, a very humble reviewer, I hope to think. Uh, I will be reviewing some recent and some classic Lit RPG audiobooks for you. Now, before I begin, I'm going to tell you that there will be some codes for the Lit RPG audiobook Game Changer shown periodically throughout the podcast. I don't even know when they're going to show up or where they'll be. So you have to look for them, write them down, and go to tantor.com to apply them. Just one to a customer, though, I do ask that. I'm not even going to say how many there are, so good luck. Uh, And once they're used up off the show, they're used up. So it's going to be first come, first serve. So the faster you find it, and if you want to use it, knock yourself out and get to it. Um, But that's it for today. There's going to be so many, I don't know when or where. Hope you enjoy having fun looking for them. They're like nice little Easter eggs for you at Christmas. Only here at the Lit RPG Audiobook Podcast will we bring you Easter eggs at Christmas time. I can't wait to see what we do on Easter. Well, today I'm going to begin with a book known as The Dead Rogue. It's part of a series, uh, The NPC's Path, book one. Uh, this is by... There's a whole lot of people here and it's all Russian, so... If I slaughter this, forgive me. Uh, it is by Pavel Kornev, Peter Burov, who is a translator, Irene Woodhead, translator, and Neil P. Woodhead, translator. It seriously took three people to translate this one single book. It wasn't that big. It's only nine hours and 39 minutes long. It's narrated by Sean Compton. The main menu of Towers of Power met me with the gloom and silence of a palace hall. My rogue appeared a couple of feet above the stone floor and skillfully landed on it in complete silence. It was me that stood up straight. John Shadow, Rogue, Level 9. Strength, 9. Agility, 14. Constitution, 11. Intelligence, 10. Perception, 11. Health, 99. Stamina, 103. Energy, 94. Damage, 6 to 10. Stealth, Plus nine. Critical damage when attacking in stealth mode, backstabbing, or attacking a paralyzed target. All right, secrets out. What you may or may not know about me is I love the rogue class. Rogues, thieves, bards. How many times have I mentioned bards? Uh, I grew up with AD&D when the bards were kind of created in the rogue style. I really love that a lot. So to me, bards are rogues. And if you have to think about it, they're pretty roguish in their own little manner. Uh, They're very randy little monsters that run around and use their music to influence people and take stuff. So, uh, you know, bards are very, very cool in my opinion. Uh, These are my people, just to put it like that. I love Sneak Thief over Paladin any day. Noble Paladins are great, and I love Paladins, but Sneak Thieves are just right there. Bards, how many episodes have I said I wanted a good bard story? Probably every other one. And I lament the lack of bard tales and burglars. You have to realize that I grew up reading about Gord the Rogue and Fafford and the Grey Mouser. And the Grey Mouser is, he's one of the most iconic thieves in fantasy. I mean, if you want to get down to it, you you go back. Grey Mouser is number one thief in literature. Okay, I mean, in in fantasy literature. Uh, My first D&D character ever was Lapoy Lightfinger who lost a couple of digits uh, trying to pick a lock early on in his career. So this book had me pretty much at the mention of the word rogue. I'm also a funeral director, so it kind of sucked me in when it came to the dead part of the title. One of my favorite horror movies of all time is Night of the Living Dead, the original. I saw that when I was about three years old, and it cemented my love for zombies and the undead. So you can see where I'm going with this, right? There's zombie stuff, and there's burglaring rogue stuff. Whoop. I'm in. All right. I'm all in. My chips are pushed in and I've got a good hand. So this book has a really interesting hook to it for me. Anyway, uh, the MC John Doe gets attacked by a player. And when he respawns, he finds that he is no longer a player. He is an NPC who is also an undead NPC. So he's kind of gone from being one thing to another. And he also, to his horror finds out, He is locked into the game, not out of the game, as a result of the hack that the attacker used on him. The hack makes makes him unable to log out, meaning that he is effectively, in the real world, in a coma. 
and unable to eat or drink anything. This means that not only is he trapped in the game, but he's on a timer. He's on a pretty solid timer. And if he doesn't manage to contact the outside, outside world, he just might die in real life. So there's a lot of consequences. Uh, John Doe faces uh, a ton of obstacles, including not being able to walk in the sunlight or speak to other players or even access his thief skills. In other words, he's totally boned. Yeah, boned and undead. I get it. I'm not as funny as I think I am. But you get the point, right? Now, this book really gripped me for about three quarters of the novel. Uh, it kind of reminds me a lot of Dakota Kraut's Rage Aside, where I was like, the book is fantastic, and then there's one slow spot that kind of tripped me up. Um, and the only slow spot here was the city siege. And like I just mentioned, in Rage Aside, there was the village dungeon thing. They just kind of just threw me out of the book for a little bit, the dungeon village. Uh, it just didn't fit the story. And here, I, I think, again, they could have just cut this dungeon, the city siege, completely out of the, the book altogether, and it would have been a much better flowy book. On the other hand, uh, who am I to say anything? Because this could be a setup for later in a series. It might be something that's important in book two or three. I don't know. Maybe he was making contacts that he's going to use later on in other books. So I can't really fault it all that much, but I just know that it was like the least enjoyable part of the book for me. I, I did enjoy seeing him level up from undead to undead type to another undead type. That was really neat. Uh, what I will say is I'm going to criticize a little bit. Uh, the leveling was just a little bit too fast, in my opinion. I mean, he goes from 0 to 50 in the first book. Uh, and that's basically, you know, two classes being shared. You know, Undead and Thief. Because uh, the XP gets split betwixt the two of those. Uh, so, I mean, there's a lot of, I mean, a lot of... of you know, leveling that goes on rapidly. It seems like every time he kills something, he levels, and which is is absolutely fine. But I, I think that you know, killing three monsters and it, oop, there's a level ding. Uh, it, it just seemed like every time he killed something, he got uh, got a level, and that's not video gamey at all. I mean, hell, if you've ever had to go out and grind, you know, by yourself. And I, I'll be honest with you, I'm one of those guys that when I used to play WoW. Um, and my character's name was Zombie Dude. Uh, when I played WoW, I did everything by myself. I hated grouping. Grouping was horrible to me. My wife used to be like, come and join my group. Come and do this. I could not do it. I just, I hated grouping. I couldn't stand it. I played City of Heroes, and I was a singular player. I leveled myself very high all by myself. I played the same quest over and over and over again until I could beat it on my own. It was never easy. But I enjoyed that far better than grouping with people and leveling up faster uh, with their, their help. And in this case, he is pretty much either on his own or he has one other person with him. And he just keeps pounding out levels. Boom, boom, boom. So that was a big thing for me was just how quickly he was increasing his levels. But again, it's just part of the book. It's part of the story. It's the way the things go. I'm not going to fault it all that much. But it was like one of those ding, ding, ding moments for me where I said, okay, it's kind of taking me out of the he's in a game thing. All right. Um, one thing I will say is that I really do like reading uh, or I should say listening to Russian authors. They have a different take on things. Uh, they have a different perspective. And I think they're really creative and they don't get as much recognition as they sometimes deserve. I mean, I do believe that they were right on the, the cutting edge or the starting edge of Lit RPG when it was birthed. And, you know, it's just pretty cool to see the perspective of someone who is not inside the U.S., you know, writing stories about Lit RPG. And it really makes me wonder, you know, are there Chinese Lit RPG stories or Japanese that are going to show up? I would love to get my hands on a couple of those just to kind of see, you know, story-wise what they do. Because I'm a big anime fan. I mean... Well, I, mean, I don't want to say big, because you're probably going to say those are the most washed out stories ever. But Naruto, my kids have grown up with me watching Naruto and Inuyasha and, you know, and Full Metal Optimist and those sorts of things. You know, Cowboy Bebop, um, which has the greatest theme song for an anime feature ever. OK, just laying that out there. Totally non sequitur. Uh, and, and again, I digress. Um, but, yeah, I do want to see other things. So I enjoy getting these Russian authors stuff because it gives me a, 
a different perspective sometimes on how things go in the in the game, uh, so to speak. Uh, now, like I said, there were some issues that I had to take care of, and, and one of those were the the translations themselves. Like I said, there are three translators in this book. I don't know why you need three translators for a book. Maybe you do. Maybe it's like uh, Bob checked this, and then Susie has to double check Bob, and then Joe double check Susie. Whatever the point. Um, Three, three was a bit much, but there were still parts where I would say the same word was used in, in the same sentence. Like it was just, just not used in the book, but I'm going to give you, it was as an example, it was a spectacular, it was spectacular how he swung the sword and it was spectacular how the sword swung home or struck home. Now, spectacular is used twice. And that's like that in the book a few more times than I would have preferred. I can give away, you know, one or two of those. And, and there's nothing wrong with that, but it doesn't sound right to my ear. And I know I want, sometimes if I'm typing something and I'm writing a story or doing something, I do that. But I go back and check it and catch it later on and, and redo it so it doesn't sound repetitive. Um, and so that was one of those things that just kind of threw me a little bit. And it's those little things that makes me feel like I'm reading a Russian novel because I could tell it was a translated novel just from that, like the, the period's of those things happening, you don't get that as very often with a, with a well-established writer, you know, really well-established writers uh, go out there and they kind of edit that sort of thing out. And here, you know, he may have been, uh, he may be a great literaturist in his own world, but when it gets translated, the translators don't bother so much to, you know, make it fit as opposed to this is a literal thing we're going to do. So I don't know. Um, but it was just one of those little tiny things that, that bugged me just a just a touch. Uh, Compton does a very solid job narrating. I think he worked the book uh, pretty well. And he did use his voice to its fullest for a premium effect. I enjoyed listening to him. And while I won't say I was, but you know, I wasn't dazzled by him. And I think he put on a great product. I do think he put out a great product. But I had no issues with the speaking or the sound quality or the characterizations. He did a really good job. I just wasn't overwhelmed by him um probably three or four books into the series i'll be like yeah he's he's he fits this perfectly um otherwise i'm just saying he he's a, a nice regular narrator I'm, I'm not saying you know like my god when i listen to luke daniels or nick Podell or jeff hayes or justin thomas james or you know andrea parsno or annalise rennie those folks um when they do stuff i'm always you guys just knock it out of the park every single time. Uh, here, I was just like, he did a really good job. Okay, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with doing a good job. Not everybody can have one magnificent book after another. Um, so this was a good run for him. Uh, this was a fun run for me uh, as I look forward to the book, the next book in the series, which I think has just been released on Audible. So that's something for you to check out. I think it came out yesterday or today. I, I, I lose time because... I don't sleep and days kind of blur together. I never know if it's Thursday or Friday or Saturday or Sunday. Um, weekends mean nothing. Holidays mean nothing. So I don't know if it was yesterday or today that it came out. Um, but I know it's out right now. Uh, so if you really, you know, you want to check this book out, you can get this one and then go right into that one if you enjoy it as much as I did. Now I'm going to say here, I'm, I'm going to give this a 7.9 stars because I did not enjoy that city siege. And I felt there was, it was just there to fluff out that book. And I admit, you know, and I will admit that he was like finding the dead man's set of equipment way far faster than you would for a man who wasn't actively looking for it. It was kind of every time he stumbled over somebody, oh, here's a piece of the dead man's equipment where I can tell you how to get there. There's that. And then there were a bit of the narration things, like I say, where uh, it wasn't the narrator's fault for the usage of the verbiage, but that just kind of just chunked it in there with the spectacular, spectacular in a sentence. Uh, so... It could have been a little bit higher. And again, that's just me being picky. I enjoyed this book one heck of a lot. Really did. Uh, and, and I have to say, I'm totally looking forward to the next book. Um, I'm sure, you know, there might be some issues somewhere else. But to me, this could be a much higher rated book, you know, if if I, I weren't such a picky, per, picky person. And so you can yell at me about that in the reviews or comments or whatever. But, you know, I mean... Yeah, because I got beat up for Lion's Quest a little bit. 
<laughs> I mean, <laughs> I had a few people, you know, message me and say, how dare you do do that to Lion's Quest? But, I, you know, I'm going to tell you my feelings. I'm being honest when I do these reviews. Um, and here, I, I enjoy this book a lot. So 7.9 stars. I don't think you'll be sorry about it. I think you'll enjoy this book. So go and get it. All right. My next book is going to be Delvers, LLC, Welcome to Ludus by Blaze Corvin. Narrated by Jeff Hayes, so this will be my sound booth spotlight, and it has a book length of 13 hours and 27 minutes. The huge man's somehow graceful legs ended in stone sandals, and his head bore a crown of the same material. His face was completely hairless, and his facial structure was subtly different from any Jason had ever seen before. He looked like an idealized version of a man. The man bowed in midair, spread his arms, and said, You'll have to forgive me for skipping the small duck, but I've transported so many of you disgusting little Terrans to this planet that I no longer bother. It's not personal. You may call me Dolos, the great god Dolos. He seemed to wait a few seconds for signs of recognition at the name, but Jason and Henry were too busy staring with their mouths open. Dolos made an impatient gesture and grunted, of course, I already know who you two are. So, Welcome to Ludus was my introduction to Blaze Corvin and Gameless Stories. Uh, the man's a writing beast. I have to say that right up front. Now, he was my introduction to Gamelit, but Domino Finn was my introduction to Lit RPG. I, I do believe. It was either him or it was, you know, Nevaniliev. Uh, but either way... They're both right there, but this was my game lit stuff, okay? And, and like I say, Corvin is just a beast of a writer. Uh, he is like a runaway train powered by quantum level energy drinks. He hits the ground, not running, but on a futuristic sky cycle that has no mufflers. So it's loud. It is loud, it's roaring, and it will, will scare you as it comes zipping by right at you. The story starts with an abduction from Earth. Uh, to the planet of Ludus by the great god Dolos. Hail Dolos! Henry and Jason, the abductees, find themselves in a deadly, deadly land that they are completely unfamiliar with. They must contend with magic and discover that their technology will not function because certain types of metal just can't survive on Ludus. In order to make it past day one, they have to eat a device that will grant them powers and let them stay alive in their new home if they can figure out how to use those powers. Um, now, from this point, the story takes off like it was written in gasoline ink and someone struck a match. Jeff Hayes is that match. The man does voices better than Mel Blank. I think you know that. Uh, that cartoony wuss Blank couldn't do women's voices. Jeff Hayes, shoot, he makes you believe he has chicks dubbing your voices for him and letting him take the credit. Uh, each character is distinctive both male and female. His emotional inflection is top of the line. Uh, Dolby THX, quality stuff. I mean, quality stuff. Honestly, I don't think I've diverged from the story for a moment. I mean, uh, you know, it, it's just that good. That I have to say that Hayes does a killer job on this book. Um, I think he is half the reason I love Delver so much. His portrayal of Henry and Jason doesn't kick butt. It shoots it in the rear with a cannon filled with grape shot. So it is, it, he, he really adds something to this story. In other words, you won't be sitting down while you're listening. You just won't be able to. You've got to stand up and move. Um, which really made my listening in the car a little problematic, you know? And while this technically isn't a sound, you know, sound booth book, I'm making my SBC spotlight just because it's Jeff and he does the, com you know, the, the company proud. Now, the world of Ludus is, is rife with beastmen, elves, I'm sorry, Ariva, orcs, goblins, etc. Basically, Corbin takes old fantasy tropes and runs them through a paper shredder, slaps it out with some paste, and paper maches it into something modern and fun and original. I loved watching Henry and Jason level up and meeting their party members. The girls are just as interesting as Jason and Henry, and the world dynamics with the men and women makes you really think. Multiple wives? Mm, I don't know. I can barely handle the one I have, and I don't know how I'd fare with more than her, to be fair about it. Still, Blaze makes it something that you 
uh, just might want to explore if you ended up on Ludus. Uh, the pair work well together, that's Henry and Jason, and get along like old friends. And it is their machinations, their scheming, and circumvention of the world's rules that will make you love them. Dolos, hell Dolos, however, is just the best. You gotta love the great God. His shiny pate brings warmth and glory to the world. Just don't let him notice you. That's trouble. Seriously, you have to love a guy who is so full of himself that he doesn't care what effect he has in your life because he's just involved in bigger and better things than you. Um, you might have found your way to Ludus via Nora Hazard, which is really fine, but, but this is the book that started it all. And this is the one that will make you crave more. Anywho, the book is fantastic. Uh, it's like they shot it into outer space, it got belted with cosmic rays, and then it returned with superpowers. It's just fantastic. And soon there will be four of them in the series. A fantastic book four books in the series. I'm not counting Nora in this series. Um, she's a separate series unto herself. It's part of the Ludus overall scheme, but there, there are Delver's books for to be done soon. Uh, so give your brain some candy. You really do need to do that. Go and listen to the audiobook um, before you die and miss out on all the greatness that is on Ludus. Now I have thought long and long and hard, and, and it, I don't know if you've seen tonight, um, this show I've had more trouble figuring out scores I want to be really fair about stuff. I have I have tried to be fair about everything. I, I've always tried to be fair. But tonight, these reviews have been so hard for me to just genuinely say, this is what this deserves. Because some of them, I really wanted to knock down their scores a little bit. Others felt, I felt that their scores, sc scores were, were too low. Uh, and here, I'm, a, I'm afraid I'm going to go too high. Too high. Um, you know... I have a deep and abiding love for this world and the characters in Dolos, and I have to admit, I'm still bedazzled. Yes, bedazzled uh, by what goes on here. Uh, and I cannot deny the way the book makes me feel. So I'm going to go with my rather ample gut and say 8.5 stars. I love this book. I love this series. And I cannot deny that fact. Uh, this is game lit gold. No apologies, no excuses. Rock solid story with bulletproof characters. Now I know there's some people that gripe about how the book starts with all the swirly imagey kind of stuff, but that's nothing. And it, actually, I like that a lot. I enjoyed it. Um, so you know, to me, from start to finish, this was a quality class act book. No questions asked. Straight down the line, you, you couldn't do better. So you know. I'm just taking it for what it is, 8.5 stars. Get this book, read this book, pick up this series, then get the Nora Hazard stuff. Get it now and enjoy. All right, my next book is The Bard, a lit RPG short story, book four of The Greenwood by Galen Wolf, narrated by Damon alums, with a book length of one hour and 47 minutes. She came and stroked my cheek, which made me tingle all over, her cool fingers and eyes crackling in my mind like plasma. I wondered what her charisma stat was. And if you get it to me, I'll give you a plus ten boost to all stats. Two it No. A month. You can do that. I can do anything I choose, Romeo. And she disappeared in a puff of smoke. So I know I just said in my review for The Dead Rogue, you know my love for bards, okay? And I'm going to be honest with you. I had gotten this... Okay, let me just go back a little bit. Um, I have to admit, I've had this book in my listening queue for a long time. I mean, a long time, probably more than a month, probably two months. Um, and, and I have to admit, when I first sat down to review this, I was really, really going to be harsh, like uber harsh, because I literally started listening to this book, no lie, five times, at least five times I can count in my head, no, I listened to it five times. I also know that I listened to the first hour at least that many times for, for an hour and 47 minute book, I listened to an hour. Of the book five times i actually fell asleep once and stopped it and had to go back so every time i did that you know if i stopped the book i went back and re-listened 
so that I would be really, really familiar with the story. Uh, I had to re-listen because I had actually forgotten pretty much everything that had happened up until the point that I I looked at my, my, my phone and said, how many minutes are left in this? Like 48 minutes, 47 minutes, 44 minutes. That's, a, that's what it was. I was like an hour over every single time. And I had no memory of what was said or done. Um, and that was after three days of waiting to get through it. Um, so yeah, I was going to be really tough because I, I, I stopped so many times and went back because there were a few times I just stopped and said, I can't listen to this right now. I'm going to listen to something else. Uh, instead, and I'll just come back to it. So I, I literally put a book in between each of those stops that I had. Uh, but I stuck it out and made it through. I mean, considering the book isn't even two hours, I was shocked at how much time <laughs> that I had put in from trying to make it from start to finish. I mean, a two-hour book, and I know I listened to it for at least six hours or more. Easily listen to this book for six hours or more. I could have listened to a regular book in the same amount of time it listened. It took me to listen to a two-hour book. Um, so it just makes it worse. And the only way I got this done was I had a drive to Columbus, okay, which is an hour one way and an hour back for me. And it gave me an opportunity to run it from start to finish with no excuses. I had to because I will always, always finish a book if I started if I didn't, I wouldn't even consider reviewing it. Uh, and I said to myself, this is two hours. I can get through this. And it was a it was a long, long car ride. It was probably the longest car ride I've had in a long time for work. Um, so here's the deal. The book, the book itself is part of a larger series. And I'm not sure if I had issues with it because I haven't read any of the other books. But as I listened to the last, I mean, listened for the last time, the book was coherent and, and it really made sense. So I had no problems following along with the action. So I, I don't think it's because it was a part of a series and it's a short story. And to me, a short story should be just that. I should be able to pick it up and know exactly what happens in a story, even though I don't know what happened in the other books of a series or anything like that. It should be self-contained from start to finish, self-contained. But I still had issues with it. And the story is really simple. Um, a bard, and I can't even think of his name, to be honest with you. That that should say something. Is hired by a goddess, i.e. a game developer, to steal a magic mirror from a lich. Now, he has to do it without revealing why he's taking it or who it's going to. And that's all fairly straightforward. But then there was like another side story that took place in, you know, in the story itself about NPCs becoming sapient, uh, the bard hiring them to become actors in his troupe and so on and so on. And it just kind of was like, why in, in the world are we even talking about this? Cause does it play into things later on? But it, it really doesn't. I mean, I listened to the book. I don't see how that was really relevant to what was happening. And, and, there were, you know, parts of the story, like the ending about a play for Midsummer's Night Dream, really, really just the whole thing. I just don't think it was necessary. I, I think he could have trimmed it down. I think the book should have been an hour in length and it would have been so much better. It had been tighter, more cohesive. And that's a lot of my problem because I think there was about really 45 minutes to maybe a little bit over an hour of stuff that could have been cut out that had nothing to do with the main plot line of the story. Uh, and, and it would have been much tighter and much, much more improved had they gone that route. Um, so I don't know. I just, it didn't tie in as well as I was hoping to. And, and half the reason I couldn't focus on the book is because it was all over the place in what was going on. <sighs> Here's the thing. I don't like giving away spoilers, right? No spoilers. But just to help you out a little bit, the mirror reveals the true self of the person who looks into it, which makes no sense to me because it's about a video game. So you're going to tell me that your NPC, or not your NPC, your PC character, you know, Sir, Sir Glance a lot because he checks out everybody, has an alter ego or has something unrevealed that you don't know as a player about him. In fact, you are the player. So it's going to reveal some hidden fact about you. Well, really, that's not what I got out of it. Uh, you know, the the reason the mirror the, the the reason why the goddess wanted the mirror made no sense at all unless she has no access to her mirror in her real life. And what it showed the bard 
was only minimally interesting. I was bored pretty much the whole way through this book. Um, I'm not going to tell you what the mirror does, but it's not spectacular. It's not mind-blowing. The reveal for what the mirror does is not mind-blowing or spectacular or a big reveal. It's just kind of a thing that's there. I just don't, you know, see what the point was to the story unless it really has, unless it's a piece of a bigger wall that's in the rest of the series. Like maybe this is like something that happens in between. And so you get to see, you know, what happens here. I don't know. Um, I think my biggest, biggest disappointment was the way the bard was portrayed using his powers. It was pretty much along the lines of, I played a sonata and put them to sleep. And then I played turkey in a straw and scrambled everyone around me until they were running in every direction going crazy. I was really hoping for more descriptions of like you know, how he strummed the music and, and lulled them into sleep or, you know, how he played his flute, uh, you know, from the fingering of the, th you know, things and making the notes swirl through the air to cause this or how the music was special or whatever. But it was more like, uh, I used Poker Face by Lady Gaga to increase my fortitude. Not very exciting. And the battle with the Lich was as predictable as Old Faithful. You get something here, and you know it's going to be used here in the big standoff. Not a surprise. I mean, I just, I just was not... I was underwhelmed. I was underwhelmed, is the best way I can put it. Uh, this was not an awesome bard tale. And I'm coming off of the Wayward Bard. So there, there's a bar that's been set. And this thing, it, it smacked its face right here on that bar. And it, it just dropped. Uh, and I hate to say that because I, I really like people to try to do bard stories. And this is not even about like how bad of a bard story it was. I was disappointed with the bard stuff. But the whole story was just a cacophony of... You know, a, it was just like throw everything in a blender that could be cool and blend it all up and you get this gray vegetable mush, you know, that you're going to make a smoothie out of. And I don't want a vegetable smoothie. Oh, my God. No. OK. I don't, I don't want to even want a fruit smoothie, but the vegetable smoothie, I don't want that at all. And this is what that was. It was a big, gross, nasty vegetable smoothie. And Damon alums. Sounds a lot like Antonio Banderas. Uh, you know, Puss in Boots. I am Puss in Boots. On Quaaludes, as he reads through this. All right. Puss in Boots on Quaaludes. Uh, it's great accent. You know, the bard has a really great accent. But he is so low key in his delivery that I know, I know that he is what put me to sleep the first time around. And I'm not doing that even justice because he does a really great, Puss in Boots, but it's very, very flat key, low key. Uh, it's a barred thing, so it's no key. There's no key. There's no note. There, it's it's just a it, it's it be flat, okay? It be flat. That's the best way I can do it. Um, he, he would be great at reading children's books at bedtime. You know, hey hey uh, Damon, can you go read that book to my kids? I most certainly will. They would be asleep in seconds because that is what he did to me. And like I say, my car ride was two hours, but it was a struggling car ride. It was just a really bad. If it hadn't been such heavy traffic, I would have probably drifted into sleep again um, for the battle scenes or or scenes of high emotions. I'm going to say I had to meh my way around and give this book my best Michaela Maroney. I am not impressed. Look. Because I'm not impressed. This could have been... Was she up there? I, I didn't get to see. Um, <laughs> this could have been so good if it had just focused on the entire purpose for the story and laid off the NPC stuff. But that just drug it down like a lead balloon that was falling from the sky. A streamlined story would have moved so much faster and a better pace. Might have made it more enjoyable. And, you know, if he had pepped up the speaking just a little bit. It might have been even better. But he spoke like this the entire time. And even Antonio Bandaras does not speak like this every moment of every day. Yo, hey, baby. I have some milk in the back. I will wipe off my whiskers. Let us go sip a bowl. No, he doesn't do that. 
he he puts a lot of emotion into his stuff. You know, there's a you know a lot of things, but this was like I mean, it's a great impression if it's an impression. If that's his natural accent, then then God help him. He he can pick up chicks all day, but he can't read to me. Uh, uh, just can't read to me. And there are also some issues with the sound quality. In between the takes, it sounded like to me and my ears, like a tape recorder uh, makes after like an audio portion cuts out, like you hear, like, you know, you know, um, I am the warrior. And, 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 you know, she stops singing and then shh, chapter two, like that, that was in there. And, and, and not only that, but it took so long to get from the end of, and I put down my sword and stepped towards the, the hidden cave. Shh. Chapter three. That was how long it was. It wasn't like and I, I put down my sword and stepped towards the hidden cave. Chapter four, you know, that sort of thing. It, it, it wasn't like that. It was too long and there was this annoying noise. Nothing big, but it was pretty annoying. It was pretty annoying. So I put on my thinking cap and said, you know, I know I'm very biased at this point. I struggled to get through this book. I, I, I forced my way to get through this book. That's never a good sign. Um, I try to be fair. There is a story. It's very cohesive. It does have a very good pace through it. Um, and, and it has a, a logical ending to everything. I might not have enjoyed it, but I can see it has a whole storyline that works. Uh, every piece is in place. There's no plot holes or anything that doesn't explain things. I just might not have been happy with the the final product so final score for me is 5.5 stars it wasn't horrible but it also wasn't for me i mean this is just about a midway book uh, if you have read the series and you know where this book fits let me know because i just don't get it i don't see the point to it i don't know if the magic mirror shows up later in the series i don't even know when this actually would appear in in the book lineup so to speak uh so I, i'm sure it's somewhere after book two or three but there, there's got to be somewhere that it would fit in there i'm hoping that there's a point to the npcs doing what they do uh, him having to grab a mirror for you know a, 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 another player basically um so i don't know i just didn't get it but i had to had to put all that together and and i just said to be fair about it 5.5 stars because i did not love it and as much as I, I want to say it, I, I I hated it less than I, I loved I loved it more than I hated it, hated it less than I loved it. Either way, you know, midway point is pretty fair in my eyes. All right. So next up, what are we doing? Fantasy Swap Online, book one by Allison Bell. Narrated by J.J. Janess. And it's three hours and one minute long. The gray loading screen faded away to reveal the bright, sunny main street of Minsk. I was back in Lorengard again, standing directly in front of the bank. But everything looked a little weird, and my body suddenly felt a lot weird. I peered at the mailbox and the characters around me, trying to figure out why such a familiar scene looked so off to me. Then it hit me. Cromgorn was a half-giant barbarian who stood nearly seven feet tall. But now I was piloting Lacey, a female human courtesan. She was only five foot six, an average human female size, so I'd lost nearly a foot and a half of height. I was used to looking down on people, and now I was straining up for every inch of height and craning my neck to look up at most of the other players, who were either men or the taller elvish races. So much, 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 much like the last book, I really wanted to play nice with this one. But this book is like a landmine that made it with a depth charge. So no matter where you go, you're going to get blown up. Just giving you advice. Uh, my advice is stay out of the pool or the yard because you don't want to become a casualty. And you will if you read this. This is a short audio book. It's under four hours and it's something you can listen to in just run, one run all the way through. Although for life me, I don't imagine how or why you could or would. And if you've read this book or listened to it and you enjoyed it, please tell me why. Please. 
I, I don't understand this at all. And I'm going to tell you, it has nothing to do with the topic. And I'll get into that in a bit. Um, well, I just said, I, I have no problem with the subject matter. And I'm a fairly open-minded dude. But I had more than a few issues with this book. First and foremost, and this is a huge sticking point for me. It seemed like Bell, the writer, has absolutely no concept of what lit RPG or even game lit is about. It comes across to me as if she saw it was a genre that was blowing up and wanted in on the action. There's nothing wrong with that. Nothing. If you are a writer and you see a, a field you like, hey, I see urban fantasy is pretty cool. I might want to try that. I think I have some ideas for urban fantasy. Go for it. I, I say knock yourself out. There is nothing to say you can only write one type of genre ever. You can do sci-fi. You can do fantasy. You can do, uh, you know, dark fantasy. Or you can do comical, com you know, comical fantasy. Or you, you get what I'm getting. Okay, you can do more than just fantasy. I'm just I'm just kidding around. But you can do a whole lot of stuff. You can do comedy. It doesn't matter as long as you don't limit yourself. But you've really got to understand, you just can't write urban fantasy and say there's a wizard that lives on the street and he does magical stuff. Okay, that is how this book came around. She saw there's an opportunity and she's going to go into a new field. And if you want to do that, do some research and get a feel for how characters act what kind of weapons they use, how how they fit into the game, what the RPG worlds are like. I mean, just as an example, there was nothing crunchy about this. And I have no problem with no crunch. I can go light snacks sort of thing. No stats, no leveling, no leveling alerts, nothing. The MC's best sword, or I'm sorry, the MC's best weapon was a level 60 sword. And that's not how a gamer would describe it. You just wouldn't. Um, the story... Otherwise, would have fit into a fantasy world, but everything about this was about the game. All right, about the game. So let me let me just do this because I really wanted it to be nice and describe this in a way that made sense and wasn't biased by my interpretation of how the book came out. Now I know Ramon does this for his books, so I'm gonna I'm gonna steal this from him. Um, I know you just you got to hear it. You got to hear the book already. So you've heard the narrator. Uh, I could probably tell you to go back and listen to that again. But I'm going to read you the blurb or the, the, the little information thing about this. So here's what it says. Now, I got to do this. But when the Lich Lord releases a powerful spell that traps most of the players in the game permanently, Cromgorn accidentally winds up stuck in the avatar of his best friend, Lacey a stupid low-level female character that was designed exclusively to get down and dirty with the in-game pleasure system. Even worse, he gets captured by the orcs and thrown into their harem dungeon, where he finds he's powerless to resist his captors. Developers really, the developers really modeled female bodies well and correctly in this game, and it's humiliating to have to go from a, being a high-level barbarian to a simpering little harem girl. With his guild drawing closer with an epic encounter with the Lich Lord, they need all the high-level players they can get. Will Krom figure out a way to get himself out of this useless body and back in time to help his friends? Or will he be stuck working forever on his back in a dirty harem dungeon? The only way out of this mess might be to give in to this situation and embrace his new body in order to outmaneuver his foes. Who knows? He might even enjoy end up enjoying himself. Okay. So you can see where the book is. It's about a dude who gets stuck in a chick's body and he's got to have sex. It's about as basic as you can get. All right. And like I said, I'm open-minded. I'm, I'm pretty fair about stuff. I have read enough sex books that th this is not going to bother me or phase me in any way. Um, but there's no concept of gaming. And, and, you know, it's just, to me, this was a slick way to add erotica to Lit RPG minus all the knowledge of what makes Lit RPG actually work. Crunch aside, this stuff was just B-A-N-A-N-A-S. All right? Weak story, no crunch. Hell, did I say crunch? There isn't even chewing gum smushes involved. I mean, seriously, the book pays a lot of lip service to Lit RPG, but it feels more like someone who researched a board game 
that had been made into a movie than they did about video games being put in the books. Okay, uh, really just seems like somebody researched like the Talisman board game, which is a fantastic get second edition Talisman. It's really expensive, but you have so much fun playing that board game. It is the best board game of all time. Sorry, I digress again. But I think that's it. Like, I, I think she actually researched a board game and said, I, I can put this into my erotica. Hmm. All right. Now, you, you all know my feelings about J.J. Janess. I've, I've talked about him with Deck Davis's one book. Um, and again, I'm not trying to beat somebody up. I, I was hoping to stay away from his stories. Um, but I think as a narrator, he is all wrong for this book. Not to mention any other books. Um, I think you know how I, I, I've, what I've said about him. Uh, he says every single sentence individually. Start, stop, start, stop, start, stop. There's no flow in his speaking. Uh, and and I, I firmly believe that the story would have been better served by a far manlier and masculine voice than his. And that's what it was needed for the realism. Not that J.J. isn't a real man, but he does not have a deep timber or a low growl that would have added much more gravitas to the story. He sounds like Mario Cantone minus the manic energy. What would have really helped this book would have been Clancy Brown type, like the Kurgan from Highlander, as opposed to Tim Curry from the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Okay? I mean, which one's going to sound more more surprising? You know, I mean, you know, you hear uh, <clears throat> Clancy Brown voice, uh, just kissed a guy. Mm, I think I like it. Uh, that's, not, that's not even a good Clancy Brown. But... <laughs> I think you get the idea, you know, uh, you know, Rocky, stop. That's Tim Curry. And that, that doesn't sound like a guy in a woman's body. That sounds like a, a woman in a woman's body, the way it comes across. And, and that's just JJ's style. It was just a weak, weak voice for what was needed here. So, you know, I'm sorry, JJ, just not the man for this job. Um, the concept itself and this is why I got this book. It had a ton of opportunity for, you know, for, for humor. And, and I think that Belle might have tried to find a funny, but if she did, it was totally missed on me. And, and I've been into comedy since I could talk. I mean, seriously, I am a huge comedy buff. I have had more old, you know, comedy albums. And I know you guys don't even remember, half of you guys don't even remember what, you know, comedy album is about, you know, the old records and stuff. But I used to listen to the worst, nastiest, dirtiest, Red Fox, Richard Pryor, Lenny Bruce, you know, I listened to those guys when I was just a wee kid, like four or five. And I, I knew what it was like to have funny stuff. So I didn't see the funny here at all, at all. Not, no funny, nowhere. I done searched and didn't see a bit. And again, I'm going to say it like this, you know, it just would have been more helpful if it had a more masculine voice. You know, it might have helped with the funny business a bit. Again, like I said, oh, I just got kissed by a guy, you know, and I liked it. You know, that kind of, you know, Katy Perry stuff. That would have been much funnier than what we got. So, final score. Two stars. Two stars. Why? One, because she deserves a star for writing a book. Because it's a book. There's a start, middle, and all that. And because there was a semi-coherent story in there somewhere. I mean, the book did have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And, you know, I could talk about a dumpster fire, but this book felt like I had visited Centralia, Pennsylvania. And, and that's one of those places, I don't know if you know Centralia, but I'm, I'm from the Panhandle, Pennsylvania, and Ohio, and West Virginia. So I know a little bit about the area, and that's where a coal fire has been going on for about since the 1960s and it's going to burn for about another 300 or 400 years underground you can't even go into the town for fear that you might go into the ground where the fire is burning okay it's been evacuated for years it's dead it's a ghost town you want to risk your life feel free to walk into it and that's what i'm telling you about this book if you want to risk it don't do it don't don't do it just stop and and turn around and, and Put your money somewhere else. Um, I mean, you could try it. You might like it. You know, Katy Perry kissed a girl and she liked it. So I don't know. Th this book was just not what I needed. And, this, and, and it is the furthest thing from lit RPG. Uh, again, it, it, 
it looks like little RPG and it sounds like little RPG from the title and the, the way the story is told. But it ain't no little RPG book. I'm just telling you that right now. Uh, it is not. And, and like I said, it she has no knowledge of what, what it is to be in the gaming system or anything at all. None. I don't even think she researched this at all. I think she just said, I can tell you about this or that. And Hey, she called her friend up to play, you know, Dungeons and Dragons. And, hey, you know, what did you do there or there? And he kind of clued her in. She took a couple notes and she did all that. That to me is what it felt like. And, and if she has actually played games and done this, then I'm sorry for her that she didn't get it. So two stars, that is my nicest possible score. Sorry. Okay, so this segment is going to be our Is It Lit RPG or Not segment. Uh, and again, I'm going to start interposing this with what else have they done? Or, you know, is it lit or not? Um, so this one today is going to be about Off to Be the Wizard by Scott Meyer. Uh, it is narrated by Luke Daniels. Uh, the book's length is 10 hours and 45 minutes. Toward the back of the file. He spent over an hour peering at the data and eventually was able to tease out some recognizable information. Whoever made this file knew a lot about him. He was irritated to find his height was wrong. It wasn't labeled height. It was just the number. But it was unmistakable. Five feet, eleven inches. It was wrong in that while that might be how tall Martin was if you went to the trouble to measure him, he'd been putting six feet two inches on every form he'd filled out since high school. He edited the number and hit save. He spent a few moments looking around at various numbers in the file, then got up to go to the bathroom. Martin stretched his arms, stood up quickly, and felt a terrible discomfort in his groin. It was like someone had grabbed the waistband of his jeans and pulled upward. These were his favorite jeans. They'd always been a little tight. He liked pants that constantly reminded you that you were wearing pants. But they never caused him anything like this sort of discomfort. He looked down at his waist. His belt was right where it usually sat, but the inseam of the jeans was definitely riding higher than usual. So th this series kind of fell into my lap as a suggestion in one of my Facebook um, announcements. Somebody had said, and forgive me, I, I couldn't go back and find it or I would I would mention you here. Um, you know, why don't you try this? And they, they had mentioned, I think, book two or three. And rather than do book two or three in a series where I'm going to get lost on what's happening, I decided to get book one and check it out from start to finish. Because if book one is Lit RPG, then books two and book three would be Lit RPG in some capacity. And and so, you know, that helped me a lot. And I appreciate this, as it helps me from having to seek out books blindly. So again, I'm going to put this out there. If you've got an idea for this segment or for, you know, anything else, I have a couple other ideas I might do periodically. Um, let me know, but I really would like to get more suggestions for this segment in particular. So, excuse me, let me say I had not heard of Scott Meyer before this book, but this cat is on my radar now. The man knows how to set up a story, and he knows, more importantly, the funny, all right? He knows humor. He can tell a funny, funny tale. It's amazing when somebody who can think they're funny can actually be funny. And I really thought, this dude knows funny. It's not overwhelming. It's not potty humor. Well, there is some potty humor in there now that I think about it, but not in the way that you think. Um, but but it's it's there, and it, it really is good, and it's fun, and it's, it's so funny. Um, the tale revolves around a guy, uh, Martin, who discovers a small piece of code that makes him realize... He is actually living in a computer program. Um, and that makes him wonder if he can manipulate the system. In other words, there is no spoon. Okay. Uh, he can rewrite some of his code and he provides all kinds of benefits to himself, such as making himself taller or teleport or making himself wealthier by inflating his bank account, etc. Naturally, this kind of leads him into getting himself into trouble with the law. I mean, you can't put money into a bank without the bank wondering where the money came from, you know, or how you put it in there without them knowing about it. So he's in trouble with the law. And before you know it, he ends up fleeing into the past where he plans on setting himself up as a wizard. I mean, why not? He can do all kinds of weird things like levitate, like I said, teleport, 
So if he can do those, why would he not pretend to be a wizard? He's got powers, after all. So we all know that nothing good comes from thinking like this, and that nothing is going to go as he's planned. And we, we would be right. We know that. We're, we're smart people. We're, we, we read. So we know, you know, <laughs> we know how the story's going to go. But more importantly, uh, Myers knows that we know that. So he's, he doesn't play it up like we're, we're idiots. He, he keeps this going just like you would hope, okay? Um, still, the book really takes off from there. And there's a ton of magic, time travel, thugs, FBI types, and wizards to keep you entranced before you know what hit you. Meyer never, never misses a beat. Um, and he has a built-in rim shot psh, psh, that appears every couple of beats to make you laugh. Um, it's a good mix of funny, ironic, satire, and seriousness that all blends together in one hell of a sweet literary smoothie. Remember I said a little while ago I didn't want a vegetable smoothie? <coughs> no vegetable smoothies. None. This is like a hamburger smoothie. Delicious stuff. Okay. Um, and, I, and I looked, and there are quite a few books in this series. I can't remember how many, but I know there's more than four or five. And I look forward to getting my grubby mitts on each one. Because just as much as I, I, I like the big names in Lit RPG, this is one of those guys that I'm going to get everything I can of his. Everything. Um, one huge benefit of the series is that it's narrated by Luke Daniels. And like Jeff Hayes, I don't think I have ever heard a book that he narrated that I just didn't love. Okay. Um, Daniels proves to be about as professional and silly a person as you can be and still be, you know, cool. Cause he, he's, he's professional and silly and he does it simultaneously, but he's cool about it. He's really cool. Okay. And I think my favorite part is where he, he imitated sounding like someone speaking into a fan. And that was pure narration brilliance. And he did it twice in different areas. Uh, and his portrayal of Jimmy was so funny. I love to hear him pronounce Philip's name because every time Jimmy said the name Philip, he popped that last P. So Philip, you know, it would, it would pop. And it was just, it was so perfect for the character. You'd have to know what goes on between, you know, uh, Martin's mentor, Philip, and Jimmy. Jimmy is Merlin, by the way. Uh, so you've got to see there's a bit of rivalry between Philip and Jimmy. Uh, they don't like each other very much. And Jimmy likes to kind of rub it in as much as he can without being overt about it. And so it, it's just funny to hear them talk. And he, and he puts that little pop in there. I don't believe it's ever mentioned in the writing, you know, like how to do that. And he, Daniels adds that in and it's such a little tiny thing. It's such a, it's a little tiny thing. And that's where I say, you know, um, great narrators versus okay narrators or good narrators. You know, the dead rogue has a good narrator. This book has a great narrator for just that reason. He puts that little pop in the P of Philip. Okay. Um, it's just added in as part of the characterization. So everybody has their own characterization, their own, you know, little personality that comes through. And I have to say that that is what brings Luke up to my number two slot for male narrators. I mean, it really does because he puts in so much stuff. It's just amazing. It's just amazing. Uh, the narration's pure brilliance. Uh, and, and I don't know how to say it any other way. Um, and I, it, he was so funny that I actually squirted milk out of my nose. And I wasn't even drinking milk, okay? So that tells you how funny that he was here, all right? So, you know, overall, the question's going to come down to, is this book lit RPG or not? Well, I'm going to say, first of all, there are a lot of things that I have to consider, all right? I mean, the book was fun. It was exciting. It had a great story. There, there was a good resolution at the end of the story, uh, so that's all going for it. If I was going to say anything, I'd probably rate it an 8.1. Uh, so that would be my guess for how I would rate this. I, I, I'm not sure if I should even rate these books. I'm going to just say, you know, what else have they done and say this. And maybe is it lit? And I'll say yes or no. And that would be what my score. But if I had to say it, it would be like an 8.1. This is a really good, fun book. So, you know, there's a lot of things going on. Uh, but I'm going to go with two things here 
for is this lit or not. First, all the wizards are self-aware NPCs. All of them. Um, if nothing else, they are very clearly NPCs. And I look at this as being like a Sims game. These people are living in a Sim world. They're, they are the Sims themselves. They don't realize it. They don't have a clue. Whatever's going on, whether they're just a simulation that's being run or it's part of an overall game, I don't know. But they are aware. They are very rare aware that they are computer algorithms. And they, they use that to their advantage. But they know they're not real people. They know what real people are, and they know they're not them. Um, so the fact that it doesn't bother them all that much... In fact, one of the characters, uh, Jimmy, uses that knowledge as a way to refute what he's done. Because he says, we're not even real. Um, and he's right. They're not. They're not real. Uh, in, in the classical sense of what's real. But these people are all self-aware. They, they think critically for themselves. So, you know, I, I think that's part one. Secondly, they are in a computer game. There's no question of that. None. Uh, because they literally rewrite the code in the game itself in order to achieve the things that they want. Now, just on those two things alone, I would say that this is lit RPG. I mean, it would be considered a trapped in the game, and these are self-aware. Now, it doesn't matter if the character is, you know, the main character is a self-aware program or if he's a gamer who's trapped in the game or just playing the game. Does that really make a difference? I, I'm going to say no. I, I don't think it does. I, I think you could write a story about a character uh, who is a complete, total, computer-generated person or thing and have it still be lit RPG as long as they're self-aware and they are aware that they are in a video game. And that is what this is. The fact that they know they are in a computer simulation cements it for me. Um, so I'm going to say it doesn't matter if it was a real human or not, or if the NPC suddenly became sentient and sapient. The end result is that they are players and they are in a game and they're in a game they cannot get out of. And therefore I'm going to say it is lit RPG. It is in my mind, lit RPG. I'm going to call it that. Uh, there's no stats, there's no crunch. So it's more game lit. It's very much more game lit, uh, but I'm going to say, you know, the fact that they're in a game and it's right there, you know, th th who they are, I'm going to call it a game lit series, lit RPG, if you want to go that route, because to me, game lit and lit RPG are pretty interchangeable terms. Uh, I'm going to say yes. Yeah, this is game lit. Um, it, is, it may not be a classical crunchy game lit, but it is game lit nonetheless, this is a solid piece of writing. It's very good, very funny, and it does fit the L lit RPG criteria. So yes, 8.1 stars. Yes, it is lit. So we have our first winner for is it lit or not. So we'll see next time around. I uh, have a big, long book, 22 hours to uh, review. Uh, we'll see where that one goes. We'll see. Uh, but this one, I'm calling it as a yes. I'm going to call it a yes. So... Well, I'd like to thank you oh so very, very much for watching, everyone. I do appreciate you taking the time to watch or listen to the show. Uh, if you want to support us, you can like the Lit RPG Podcast Facebook page or the YouTube page or just like and share the video. I am going to ask for more suggestions for the Is It Lit segment because uh, if I, I get more, it's going to be very helpful. I've got a good one for next time, but I will always need new ideas, more suggestions. Uh, please leave any comments or suggestions in the comment section below. That's what it's for, and that's why I use comments twice in the same sentence within a period of about three words. Uh, and feel free to tell me whatever you like. If you think I stink, say so and tell me why. I can always improve or try. Uh, I also enjoy the feedback very much. Just remember, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher. For the Lit RPG Audiobook Podcast, I'm Ray. Keep listening.